Bill's departure from our regularly scheduled program this evening, one that I uh, think most of us will have a uh, great deal of interest in. I'm referring to the uh, proposed mill levy by the uh, Platte Canyon School District. We're privileged tonight to have uh, Dr. Richard A. Laughlin in attendance, who will speak to this, speak to us on this subject. Uh, to bring this a little closer to home, Dr. Laughlin graduated from high school in Craig, Colorado, and his doctorate was received from the uh, University of Colorado. Boulder. Dr. Laughlin, we'll uh, turn this meeting over to you for your comments, and we'll have a short, it's, uh, not just criticism, but a sincere interest mm -hmm. in our school here in uh, Thank you very much. I think you brought out some uh, thoughts that possibly we all were not aware of. Now may I ask uh, Betty Flint to introduce our speaker on the seat. Look at Jack in the Box, I pop up. Remember those wonderful field trips we had this summer? Especially two that were led by our very own historian, Harold Warren, and he's going to be our wonderful speaker tonight. So I give you Harold Warren right over here at the end of the table. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, I went and called the sheriff's office, and this is how they throw you off. Turns out that the skeleton was found uh, down in Darrow on Highway 9 towards Hartzell, and we're not going to go to salt work. So well, this is what happens to your history. The people foul you up a little bit. You get running in the wrong direction and spinning your wheels. But I already knew about the burial ground down there by Garrow. See, the Ute Indians, when they got the horse, they came over the mountains and uh, were hunting during the summer over in the park. And the Plains Indians with their horses, they came up in these mountain valleys hunting during the summer too. And you can't blame them, even we white people do this sort of thing, recreation and all. So uh, they were always fighting. And uh, any deaths that occurred were, they were buried on the spot. Well, down there, Yarrow, it depended on who was in control of the area at the time. The Ute Indians buried their people. And the uh, Plains Indians, they put their people up on the scaffolds. So you have both types of burial down there by Garrow along this rocky ridge. And uh, a number of years ago, I talked to Frank Turner before he died. In fact, I'm always talking to people before they die. I just catch up with them after they die, then I take the big questions back. Anyway, he was down there one day, sitting up on a little ledge on the side of the rocky hill there, and he was watching a friend of his down below picking up beads. And he was leaning back there with his hands back like this. When he straightened up, he brought a handful of the sand up and looked at it, and there was a handful of beads. When he turned around and looked, here was this uh, Indian skeleton there, and he'd had his hand right on the guy's face. And he had yards of beads wrapped around his neck, Apparently, when they buried him, his face was covered with red pigment. And uh, that had gone through and uh, uh, turned the skull red on the face part of it. And so uh, I think the skeleton finally wound up in the doctor's office down at Colorado Springs. So I knew that there was a burial ground there. Also, I talked to uh, May Flynn, and she was one of the descendants of the Carrolls. They were French people who came in in the early 60s down there, had a ranch. And uh, when she was a little girl down there, she said the kids used to go over there and play in that Indian burial ground. And it was nice because the, so many of the Indians' possessions are buried with them, and so the kids had all the artifacts to play with that they wanted. The only problem was, when they came back home, my mother would meet them at the door, and make them take off their clothes and take a bath and put, off clean, put on clean clothes, or she'd let them in the house, they were so stinky. So <laughs> these are some of the things that happened way back in the beginning. And in the later days, of course, uh, the white man, he came up here and he had to have kind of, some kind of burial ground. Now the earliest burial I know of in the county, this is a, uh, copy of a book that the Dr. Nolly Mummy put out. And it's a copy of some early day mining rules and regulations over on Buckskin Creek there in the, that mining district, the Buckskin Joe. And uh, so I find here that in May of 1860 that uh, they decided that the proceeds of the Nash claim be paid to his widow by the man that works the same. In other words, somebody had died over there. And then by August of that same year, we find that they uh, set up a group of people, they appointed them to find a parcel of ground for burials. And then in September of that same year, they decided where to put the Buckskin Cemetery. It's still in existence up there, got a lot of old graves in it. The town of Alma now has taken that over. Well, that's one of the earliest records of any uh, cemeteries in the county. You can go back down here, for instance, to the Horn Cemetery. The county back in 1976 asked us to do uh, make maps of some of the cemeteries in the county, some of the larger ones. Well, since Alma had Buckskin Joe and Fairplay had their own cemeteries and were running them, we didn't bother with those. 
but we did take about nine others. The biggest one was this one at home. And this is all done to scale in here. We gave everyone a three by six foot space in the cemetery. And there's about five acres in there. And we went around the fence and every 50 feet, we put a marker. And then we came back and ran nylon string across from point to point and set all the cemetery off in 50 foot squares. About like you would do an archeological dig. And then from the two sides, we would measure to the head of each one of these graves. And that way we were able to put them all on the map like this. There's almost 600 there. And I'd say at least 50% of them are unknown. There are no markers for them on there. But then we came back and we numbered each one of these graves from one right on up. And then if there was nothing on the grave there, no marker, we would write after that number unknown. And if there was a marker there, we would write down uh, whatever names or dates were on the stone. And then, that was all handwritten, then we went and typed up all of these. Well, they're not in alphabetical order or anything. In fact, on any of these, uh, the listings, so if you get a name of a person, they want to know where the grave is in the county, uh, you're going to have to go through all of these. So what we did was type up an individual card on each marked grave in the county whether it's an individual or in a large cemetery, whatever. And so up to 1976, we have a card for each individual in a marked grave in the county, something that they never had before. And we're going a step further now. When I go through, I have microfilm on most of the old Fair Play Flume. And if we uh, are going through this microfilm and see where someone died, there's a obituary in there, says he was buried, say, in Fair Play, Como, Como, whatever, we will check the card file, and if they're not listed in there, then we know they're in an unmarked grave in that cemetery. So we can still make a card and pinpoint them that close to where they actually were buried. So these are some of the little things we are doing. We've done this with the Como Cemetery, the Horn Cemetery, the Shawnee, the Webster, the Bordenville, the uh, Lake George, and the Guffey, and the Buffalo Springs. We've done all of those. And I think we've pretty well covered the county. That's all of the Mark Drake. And this is a little printout from the Foothill Genealogical Society. The Colorado Genealogical Society wanted to do all the graves and burials in the state. And so they came to me and made this print out of what I had up here, whether they're individuals and their location and his legal descriptions and everything. And so we have all of that. This is kind of silly. This little deal here, these are plot maps of the entire county. Seven and a half minute up here, wherever they're available, 15 minute down here. But these quad maps, while they do have section, township, and range on them, they aren't tied in uh, with those. They're tied in with the longitude and latitude. And each one of these maps has a name uh, that I have put in alphabetical order here. But they don't tell you just exactly which map to look at. So over here, I took a Forest Service map and drew the longitude and latitude lines on it here. And so if I'm interested in a particular area, I can pick it up here, and right away it tells me what map I want to look at over here in alphabetical order. And then I went ahead, and wherever there was anything of historic interest, including these cemeteries and burials, I put a little dot and numbered it. And I put an H after the number for a historic. And sometime I could go through and do another list and probably mark it A for archaeological and put all of the old Indian pre prehistoric man, the Stone Age people, put their campgrounds on. Then we can draw the trails from one to another uh, of these campgrounds and show what it was like when these people were up here long before the white man came. And uh, 
At, at the moment, we could probably put down over a hundred of those in campgrounds. And as far as I know, Lenore and I are the only ones left that know where these are. Because a lot of them, even in our time, have been destroyed. Or something has been built on them, or there, there's at least three of them. The 285 has gone through since it, it has been uh, widened. And there's uh, at least three of them I know of that Forest Service has built campgrounds on. And this more or less wiped them out because the only clue to them uh, would be the flint chips and flakes for making their tools. I got a couple of little arrowheads here. Uh, what happened was we were down at Lake George doing the Lake George Cemetery years ago. And uh, it becomes a little confusing when these uh, people who want to look up their ancestors and it says they were buried, say, in Jefferson County, something like that. And it creates a problem because before 1908, there was a portion of the Jefferson County down there uh, in uh, that uh, ran a long finger into uh, Park County. It was supposed to come right straight south here until they hit the river and come back up through the center of the river. Well, this cut this portion of the county was uh, Jefferson County was cut off from contact with their uh, county seat at Golden and it was hard to get any assistance for schools, roads, or anything, even election <coughs> So it was proposed to give that portion of Jefferson County to Park County, and they did that. It was put to a vote of the people, and uh, actually there were uh, what was it, 450 voted to accept that land from Jefferson County, and five voted against it. So you're never going to get 100 percent even if you make a gift out of that. But <laughs> now that is in Park County, where before it was in Jefferson County. And uh, we had one lady over at uh, Meeker. She said she'd been looking for her great-grandfather's grave years ago. He was killed by Indians. And we said it was no problem. He was down in the Lake George Cemetery. And there's the marker that's on his grave. It says Summit Marksbury, killed by Indians. No date or anything. And of course, killed by Indians, that to us meant Arrowhead. So here we were doing the cemetery down there. Seeing all was buried there. And I picked up this little point down there. I said, this is the one that killed Mark. About <laughs> <laughs> two minutes later, Lenore comes along and uh, she picks this one up. So that ruined my story. And besides that, after we checked the story in the Rocky Mountain News about the killing of Mark Bird, we found he was shot in the back by an Indian using a rifle. We kept the arrow here. And uh, then we found the chips and flakes and found that the cemetery is on the old Indian campground down there. And you always think, well, gee, you've run some of these things down. The lady came along, she had no trouble finding this marker on the uh, grave down there. And so then she came back and said, who in the world put that marker on the grave? The man who was killed by Indians was James Pleasant Mark. Mark for it. My mouth's getting dry. I may have to go back and take a swallow of water. Anyway, she said his name was James Pleasant Markbury, and Summit was the name of his son who was born over in Summit County and is buried down in California. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he was uh, Markbury was supposed to have a uh, ranch down there. Just off the carry all, and we have on the map Marksbury Gulch down there. And he should be on the records over in Fairplay as taking up that land from the public domain. But apparently he was killed before he had done that. And so you wonder just where the old ranch was over there. And you find out that he came out here from Kentucky after he lost everything uh, from the Civil War. 
and he came out here with a friend who was by the name of Davenport. Well, he was ranching uh, in the gulch over there, and Davenport, thanks a lot, you right. didn't spike it. No. Anyway, uh, Davenport, his friend, went over and got a job over at Leadville. And so after Mark Burry was killed, the widow got in touch with Mr. Davenport over at Leadville, talked him into coming over here, and uh, he got off the stage down there where it crosses the river by Lake George, present day Lake George. And she picked him up in the buckboard and took him up to the ranch and talked him into marrying her. So the records <laughs> over there at Fairplay show that it uh, was uh, improved, or approved up on by the Davenports. And uh, then they sold out and went over on the Western Slope. So you see, you keep trying, but you never quite get all the answers to some of these things. And they're simple once you've got them, but in the meantime, it's rather... One of the oldest marked graves we have found is just a native stone marker over roughly east of uh, Como, or about across from where the old town of Hamilton was. It's made out of uh, native stone, and they have chipped flaked on it. It says, in memory of A.H. Allen. See, he died October 13, 1860. And that's the oldest marker we've found. It's all by itself out in the hay meadow. And I've got uh, legal descriptions of all of these, and where I can, I put in verbal description. Going back for a moment to these maps, I said I had numbered each one of these sites, and I pinpointed them on the map. Well, I used some old forms that the State Historical Society was using, and I filled them out here, and uh, gave the name of the site and uh, where it was in, in Park County, whether it was on public land, private land, or whatever, and the legal description and the verbal description. Up here, I put the number of it, and also what one of the quad maps of the song. So I can pick it all up through here. And I had a duplicate copy of this where I put the sites in alphabetical order. So then, with the name of the site, I could turn to the other book, and it would tell me where it was on the map, when I had the map to refer to. But uh, as I recall, I lent that alphabetical copy to Laverne, and I think she forgot where it came from. <laughs> and I would like to revise these, bring them up to date. Otherwise, I've got the originals. I could make me another copy. And uh, at five cents a, a sheet, uh, it would cost me about seven dollars to do. I gave a set of those to the high school library over here, and they disappeared. I gave a set to the uh, county, and I'm not sure just where they've gone. I know one of those books is down in the building and zoning office. I took a set down to the State Historical Society. This is when they had uh, a lot of people in there helping them, and the man at the desk was one of our well-known authors. And I gave him the set for the society. I went down there some time later, after all these volunteers were gone, the society had never heard of them. They disappeared, apparently, they took them home with them. So these are some of the things that happened, but it's nice to have duplicates of everything. So, here's a few other pictures I have here. This is Joe Tester Sweet. And uh, there was a post office down on Kern Creek, the little Kern Creek Pass in the lower end of the county going towards Guffy. And uh, the post office was called Kester. And uh, it turns out that this man is the one, and he used his middle name to name the post office. He left down there and moved over uh, by Buffalo Springs, and he's buried in the Buffalo Springs Cemetery now. And this is another interesting man. This is John Parmley. Uh, he started out back east, he was born up in the New England state, and he started west working for a fur company. He was trading with the Indians. He put up the first building at the Moines, Iowa as an Indian trading post. 
He married Halda Smith, the daughter of an Indian trader. And in 1860, they came on out here. They tried mining a little bit. He had a sawmill, and uh, then he got to working on roads. He is the one that built the Turkey Creek Coal Road. And uh, Parmalee Gulfs, they built their cabin there, and this is where the name for Parmalee came from. And he went on over in the park there, and it was his <coughs> oldest son, George, who started up the Deer Valley stage stop over here on Clerk Creek. Well, both of those people are buried over in the Buffalo Springs <coughs> Cemetery, and here's their marker over there, two different shots of it. One on the side shows his wife, and the other one shows him. Yeah. Well, let's see. This is an interesting little group here. I want to run the house on in. This man is Hiram E.D. Turner. And he came out with the first gold rush people, and then he went back and brought his family out. And uh, he did most of his early day mining over in Summit County. And uh, his son was the first white child born in Summit County. And so they called him Summit County Turner. And uh, he grew up over here, and then he left and went to Montana. And nobody ever heard of him since then. They don't know what happened to him up there. Here is a picture of him on horseback as a man. You can look at all these things after I get through up here. Uh, it's rather interesting that uh, these things were being taken to the dump by uh, Turner's widow, one of the grandchildren. After he died, the widow was cleaning everything out. She says, you can have this box of pictures, otherwise you're going to the dump. So what could I do? I took them. A lot of uh, <laughs> unnamed people in it, but there were a lot of interesting ones too. Now, uh, when Hiram died at down at Garrow, they buried him up at Como. And here is the copy of the permit to ship him by a train from Garrow up to Como. So those are all the little things you keep gathering. Now, back in the early days, when they started the uh, cemetery at Como, the first one was down in town. And it was started before there was a town of Como. And one of the folks in there was Dan McLaughlin. He had a marker and all on his grave there. And uh, in 1887, the uh, coal company up there deeded five acres of land to Como for a cemetery. They deeded to the board of trustees of the town there. And uh, then they sent letters around to everyone who had anyone buried in the cemetery, telling them they're going to move them over to the new cemetery. And this is a copy of the letter that was sent to McLaughlin's son. May I ask you a question? Why? <laughs> was Dan McLaughlin's Alice uh, Wander's no. uh, father? That was a separate one. Alice's father was Matthew McLaughlin over at Fairplay, and he had the stagecoaches and uh, freight lines out of Fairplay. Thank you. <coughs> Dan was there, I think, before McLaughlin, because Dan is the one who had the stage station there near Como, and the Reynolds gang came through in 1864. And, uh, uh, most of the loot they talk about being buried up in this country by the Reynolds gang uh, was taken from a stagecoach at that time and at McLaughlin stage stop. And uh, like I've said before, I don't know, I've uh, talked several different times about these things, so I don't know. Sometimes I'll be repeating myself. But uh, a lot of the people writing up about the Reynolds gang say that no one will ever know what was taken by the gang in that robbery. And it's mostly the value is based on what was taken during that stagecoach holder. And uh, each year it goes up a little more. The last time it was over $100,000 worth of loot. And uh, as I say, these writers say no one will ever know what was taken in that stagecoach holder. What they don't realize is that when that stagecoach was held up, 
It was carrying the U.S. mail, which made it a federal offense. So over at Laurette, uh, that's Buckskin Jewel, that was called Laurette at that time, uh, they had a federal judge there, and they drew up indictments against the survivors of the Reynolds gang. And in those indictments, they listed everything that was taken in the state court holdup, from a revolver to a $6 skull to an $800 horse, the whole bit. And they came up with a little bit of paper money. But during the Civil War, that wasn't considered of much value, really. Although in the uh, indictment, they said so many $5 bills and of the value of $5, so many 10s, so many 20s, that sort of thing. But there was uh, some uh, placer gold taken in the hold up, too. But anyway, you had all of those things up, from the shawl to the horse, the watch, $500 watch, the whole bit, and you come up with less than $5,000. And as I say, now it's 100000 That's an you're, you're always uh, fighting against these people, too, uh, who don't pay any attention to dating of things. Things can't happen until other things have happened. In other words, you can't ride this railroad before the tracks were laid up here or after they pulled them up. And you'd be surprised how many of these historians want to do that. Or they don't consider the age of people. It's a problem. And uh, I think uh, one of these uh, uh, little uh, stories that came out this summer was about the Reynolds gang. And they said that Clark Harriman cut off Owen Singletary's head and took it over to uh, Montgomery. Well, that's all right if there's just one problem. At that time, Clark Harriman, the son of George Harriman, who built Kenosha House on Kenosha Pass, was only 12 years old. <laughs> and we have uh, another little thing that's rather strange. Uh, Ms. Dr. Mummy, who did this view on the uh, mining up there on Buckskin, uh, he was trying to find out the story about silver here. And he has traced the naming of that mountain back to 1866. But he thinks that most of the story about silver deals originated from Colonel Frank Mayer over there. Uh, he died in 1954 at the age of 104. He was born in 1850. And uh, so he wanted to tell you all about silver heels and the smallpox epidemic, how she nursed the miners and all. And uh, he knew all about it because at the time this happened, and this was before 1866, he was U.S. Marshal over there. <laughs> and in 1850, he was less than 16 years old when he made up the story. <laughs> and it's like the uh, uh, prunes the burrow on Front Street over in Fair Play there. Now, uh, we had a lot of wild burros running around over there. Anytime anybody wanted a few pack animals, they just went out and grabbed them and used them, turned them loose again to shift for themselves. And then, during the Depression years, everything was slow, and some guys in the bar over there decided to whip up this story about prunes. So they rolled up all about this prunes. He'd been here since the beginning of time, and finally died of old age up there in the 60s. And, uh, <laughs> and we have this lady born and raised up there in Alma who remembers when they went up to Alma and picked the bones up off the dump to take down the fair play. <laughs> and of course we have uh, uh, one of the old miners, Rube Sherwood, who said he owned prunes at one time. We have, supposedly, have him buried down there with Prunes Monument on Front Street in fair play. Well, I don't know how far they went. He was cremated, so his ashes might have been strewn around there somewhere. But these are the crazy things that these people come up with. And you don't have time to shoot them all down. You're too busy with your own lives. <laughs> <laughs> you which way to go so that my lives at least are authentic. I've got them backed up with dates. <laughs> well, we've got another little, we have the big cemetery over there at Fair Play, and of course, uh, among the marked graves over there is Mr. Hoover. He's the one that killed the man there in Fair Play, shot him down in cold flood, and uh, the uh, judge gave him a life sentence for the murder. 
and the vigilantes didn't like it. You mean it quit on me already? Yep. I've only been talking 45 minutes and we're back now. So the vigilante came in and took him out of the jail, which at that time was in the bottom of the uh, courthouse, took him up on the second floor, and uh, hung him out the window up there, over the doorway. And uh, they were strictly concerned with justice, because at that time we had uh, Cicero Sims in there, and he was waiting to be hung legally. Well, that was all right with the vigilante. These other guys, and they didn't think the sentence was right, they went and did the job for the judge. And uh, Cicero Sin is the only legal hanging we ever had in the county. At that time, anyone who uh, was sentenced to hang had to be taken to the county where the murder occurred and uh, be hung there. Now, in 1895, when Ratcliffe killed the three school board members, and I shouldn't have killed that fellow there. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> he didn't like the school board members, so he went down there on the ferry all and caught three of them in the little one-room schoolhouse and shot them all dead. Uh, two of them are buried in the Como Cemetery. The other one, Sam Taylor, well, he and his wife was one of the bonus daughters, and so he was taken down on the bonus ranch by the Terry Hall Reservoir. And I haven't ever gone down there to try to locate him. I imagine he's got a marker and all. And uh, of course, Radcliffe was sentenced to be hung. But uh, by that time, they had changed their rules. You took the man to be hung down to Canyon City. Then you hung him, and after that, you could take him wherever you wanted to. So after he was hung, they brought him back up on the terrier, and they buried him on the Forest Service land just outside of his property off of Rock Creek. And I've got a little picture of the marker at home. It's just a little uh, white spire that stands about this high. There's no name on it or anything, but his son erected that. And the very time you keep after these people, we have this lady at Lake George that wrote about uh, Lake George, the history on the Terriol and all of this. And uh, she tells about Gottlieb Schumann. He disappeared down there in the 1890s. He said, talking suicide. He said, if I die, no one will ever find me. But, uh, and so for years they searched for him. They didn't know. They even had a reward out for the finding of the body and all. But back in World War II, we had some soldiers camping down there. One of them got lost and saw a reflection across the gulch from where he was. He went over to check it out. It was a piece of class that uh, Flume had put up in this cave. And he went in the cave, and here was Flume's skeleton and old guns and things like that. But uh, I knew all about that. And uh, so this woman, writing about the history of the Terriol, she talked about the killing of these people up in the schoolhouse. And I said, sure, student, she's going to say that Gottlieb Sloman did that. And sure enough, she did. Mm -hmm. So accused of all of these. Or, uh, I mean, Radcliffe would be accused of all of this, including doing away with uh, Gottlieb Sloman. And uh, it was hours driving down there to where all of this happened. Uh, Radcliffe would never have gone down that far. But uh, she had the story about how uh, Ratcliffe's kids, two of the boys had come down there and uh, they'd been uh, stealing horses. And they stopped by Flumens and gave him a bad time, even uh, spit chewing tobacco in the face of his horse down there. And uh, very upsetting and all that. And uh, so in a little deal I wrote to Fair Play Flume years ago, in which they published, I told him that Ratcliffe was going to be accused of killing Flumen. Uh, and I said, now we know why Ratcliffe killed these school board members. It was because they were teaching his kids to chew tobacco and steal horses. <laughs> and I said, on top of that, Ratcliffe is going to be very surprised to know that he had two sons and a daughter, but all the time he thought he had two daughters and a son. <laughs> he confused too. But these people won't research this stuff and up with some of the right answers. 
So we've got another little cemetery. It's right in the cemetery. There are seven graves there. Three of them are marked, and four of them are not. The two of the marked graves are for McLaughlin women. And that's understandable with Matthew McLaughlin being there with his stagecoaches and all livery stables and all that. In fact, his livery stable, the back of it, is still standing on Front Street in Fair Play. You go in there and you can still smell the old horseman in there. <laughs> Hasn't changed a bit down here. <laughs> old hand hewn beam timbers in it and all that sort of thing. But uh, back to the Others, there are one other marked grave there, is Abram Nelson Shue. He was killed in the spring of 1863. And the other four graves are not marked. But you go back in history and research this, and you find that uh, there were uh, two Espinosas came up out of the San Luis Valley, and that uh, they had uh, some kind of an obsession. They wanted to kill people from Andrews. They killed one man down by Lake George. He's buried in the Rocky Cemetery down there. And uh, then they came on up around Fairplay there. And uh, they killed two men near Kenosha Pass from ambush. They killed two men on Red Hill Pass. And they killed one man over where the mosquito comes into the river between Fairplay and Allen. And uh, the man who was killed, Carter there, uh, by the Mosquito Creek where it comes into the flag. Uh, one of the other fellows was shot at, and they missed him, and he got away. And he came on into Fair Play and told them about what had happened. That was the first time that they had even heard of who was doing these killings. But they went up there, and they tried to track the guy. They took off going up the stream there, and they lost their track. But then the two men made a mistake. Over on Red Hill, the last two men they killed, they shot one and killed him instantly. The other one they wounded, so they caught up with him and beat his brains out. But the reason they made their mistake was up until then, they'd been going through the country on foot. And they took the two men's horses. And that was a dead giveaway. The posse started tracking them down and caught up with them just across the line in Fremont County. And they killed one of them. The other one got away. Went back down to the San Luis Valley. But that gulch down there in Fremont County is still called Espinosa Gulf. Uh, Shoup, the other man who was killed, his brother was an officer in the Colorado Volunteers in the cavalry. And this was during the Civil War. And so he was out in the field at the time he got word of his brother's death. But he is the one that put up the uh, grave marker for his brother up there. And Father Dyer, and he's put the snowshoe out to and tells about what went on. And he said all five men were buried in fair play. So I think it's reasonably safe to assume that the four unmarked graves are the other four victims of the Espinosa. And uh, Mr. Shoup then offered a $500 reward for the other Espinosa. And also the state put up a little bounty on the man. So Tom Tobin took off from Fort Garland down there in San Luis Valley. And when he came back to collect his reward, he had the other Espinosa's head in a gun sack. You see, these people, they were down to earth, sort of. Here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Shoup himself went on up to Idaho. The uh, gold mining boom was petering out and all. And he was the last territorial and first state governor up there, and also a U.S. senator. So he went on to be something up there, too. And we lost him down here. But as I say, these are some of the crazy things that have gone on, the things that you find out. Uh, people think, well, gee, you're silly messing around these cemeteries. It's kind of a morbid type of thing. But he lives. Here's all these people you know all about who they're friends of yours. And of all of those that I have seen, and I also worked for only the mortuary for a little while on the night shift, bringing in these bodies to the mortuary. And I figured at one time I brought in over 2,000 of them. And of all of these dead people, I have never had a bit of trouble from any of them. It's these doggone live ones that's getting 
Uh, for a couple of years, I drove a school bus <laughs> back when everybody was over in the Deer Creek School, and we only had the one school bus. And by the time I'd come from the school down to the top of Crow Hill, uh, they were getting pretty noisy. So I had to usually stop if they were getting too bad and give a little talk. And so I pulled off the road there one time, and I told them all about these people I brought in when I was working at the mortuary. I said, not a one of those people had ever given me any trouble, and I said, I don't want any out of you. And for about two weeks, they were just as nice as The Buffalo Springs Cemetery, that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, the uh, property lines go right through the middle of it. It's only a little one, about 100 feet square, all fenced in and all. And this is where it finally is. The oldest marker in there is one of the Green children. Mr. Green came down there and homesteaded at the Buffalo Springs. The springs themselves are warm springs. I've never seen the pond right to the spring ever freeze over. So he homesteaded in there in 1863, and for some reason or other, he called the ranch the 63 Ranch, and it's still known as that today. And one of the first marked graves in there was one of his children who died in there. You can't believe how many children died up in this country. You getting tired yet? You want to drink them all? <laughs> he sold out down there finally. Moved down to Canyon City and uh, they talked him into putting his money into one of the banks down there. The bank went broke. He was the only man who got all his money out of it. He went in the bank with his rifle and he went right up to the <laughs> and he says, if I don't get my money, I'm not getting out of here a lot. And he was the only one of all those the So I say, they had basic ways of settling things. <laughs> and this is what happened up Hall Valley, too. Uh, Colonel Hall developed the mines up there in the early 70s, using English money. But he wanted, he had the little town all down there was in uh, on the river there where Hancock Gulch comes into the river. And it was four miles from there up to the mines, so he needed some way of getting back and forth. So he built a little tramway going up to the mines. And he'd have mules or oxen pull these little carts up there. And of course, in the early 70s, that was long before the railroad came through. So where did he get the rails for his tramway and stuff? Well, we don't know for sure except the streets were up there at the turn of the century. And uh, when they moved out and went down to Florida, the son, and he's another one of those who died in his 80s a number of years ago. It worries me. I'm getting old too. <laughs> he said that his father timbered some of the land down in Florida, and he built that same type of railway down there, tramway down there, to get the timber out. All he did was take up here the uh, lodgepole pine and match them, they're long slender poles, and he used those for rails. And instead of using the flanged wheels like is on the railroad, he used a spool-shaped wheel. And they just followed those logs right up and back. And of course, they were easily replaced if the logs wore out. So, but anyway, while they were building the uh, tramway up there, there were some fellows that came over from Fairplay and opened up a saloon up there. And they were getting all the workers drunk, and uh, they were carrying on at great length, going around there, waving their shit shooters on everybody's nose, and telling them about how if Colonel Hall showed up there, they were going to shoot him. It was really something. So finally, they realized they were going to have to do something about these men. So eight men with rifles got the drop on three of the worst offenders there, and they locked them up in a shed up there, and were going to take them over to the fair the next day. In the meantime, they talked to the men, tried to reason with them. They said, if you just leave the gulch quietly, we'll give you back your guns, we'll forget the whole thing. Well, they wouldn't listen. So one man, apparently, had been in the Civil War. He said, As I was a guerrilla during the Civil War, and I know how to do it. When I get my guns back, I'm going to shoot these men that got the drop on us. I'm going to burn all your buildings down, and uh, carry it on like, like that during the night. So the next morning when the people went out, two of them were decorating trees up there. Apparently the third one got the message and left quietly. 
and there was a little article in the Georgetown newspaper about how quiet it was in the adults. Apparently, some of the other undesirables had also gotten the masses and had left. Of course, you read about these early day people and what they did, you figure that uh, what you'd like to know, what finally happened to a lot of them. And generally speaking, you figure uh, if you can find a grave, well, that's the end of the story. Uh, Colonel Hall, I still don't know where he was buried, but there was another article in the newspaper about him. He was used spending English money. He would bring the English people over here, wine them, dine them, take them big game hunting and all this sort of thing. So here's this article in the newspaper that said, while on a hunting expedition up in North Park, he was killed by a bear. So you figured, well, that's it then, up in North Park somewhere. So a couple of weeks later, here's another article in the newspaper that says, Colonel Hall was killed by a bear while hunting up in North Park and whose remains were shipped to Fair Play for burial, has just walked into the office to find out the details of his death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in more recent times, we've got this grave up uh, Geneva there. And I can point, we've got a nice little dark granite marker there, Denninger, gives his date of birth, date of death, the whole bit, I put him on the map here and made a card for him and everything. And then Nisi Keeves comes down here and tells me you're going to have to do something about his grave. I said, why? She said, because when he died, he was buried up on the Tumbling River Ranch that they had. And because he was the caretaker for Mrs. Porter, who had the rock house uh, down towards the uh, Grand from the Tumbling River, he was their caretaker, so she wanted him buried on her place. So she hired two men to go up there and dig him up and put him down on her plate. Well, they got down as far as the casket and chickened out. They took a shovel full of dirt and his tombstone down there, made him a new grave, which I have marked. And she says, he's still up on Tumbling River. <laughs> so then I go to the Fair Play Flume and look up his obituary. And I find that he had a sister back in New Jersey. It says she came out here and took the body back there. So where is it? <laughs> You'd think these people would stay in one place. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy Lee Sloman, he had guns down there uh, in the cave with him and a revolver. He had his uh, Swiss passport and everything uh, put in a tub suspended from the ceiling so the pack rats couldn't get it. And for a long time, all of those things were in the sheriff's office over there at Fair Play. And uh, all of a sudden, they disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to the skeleton, the skull, or anything. Nobody knows what happened to the guns. They just all up and disappeared. So one of the foresters over at Fair Play, his wife bought him the shotgun from the druggist over there who collects guns. He bought it for uh, Bill Blunt as a Christmas present. And it's a, a double barrel shotgun. It's got a uh, Dr. Stone's uh, name etched on it and everything. And so I talked to the druggist one day because he also had a rifle with him. And so I was talking to him about this rifle. I said when it uh, was first found, they said it looked like there had been a bullet go through the stock of the gun. And if he'd been holding it to his shoulder at the time that happened, it would have killed him. And uh, so he said, no, it didn't have a bullet hole through the stock. He says, sometime if you'd like to see it, you can take a picture of it. The next time I went back and talked to him about it, he didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> These people are strange. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that time's running out. I'm sure there might be some questions you might want to ask me. And I probably don't know the answers, but I can try. <laughs> uh, the green you talked about up there at Buffalo Springs and then he went to Kansas City. Was he in relation to the Johnny Green at Buffalo Springs? No connection one here. Because he was still alive when I came up here in the third father green. Yeah. One of his sons is still running the store now. Yeah. And there's a grandson working down at the uh, Cheeseman Dam for a lot of work, things like that. But no relation. Uh, Greens had water rights on the river over there, and there was a little lake over there called Green Lake. And that has now become a part of Ontario Reservoir. Uh, 
Carol, I know where Buffalo Creek is, but where are Buffalo Springs? Well, which uh, Buffalo Creek are you talking about? Well, the one up near Tommy, that way. Yeah, well, that's another one. No. We have one over in the park that's called Buffalo Creek, too. Well, where is Buffalo Springs? Uh, it's over in the park, right alongside 285. Oh, it's about 12 miles or so down 285. Uh, it's right across from uh, where the Western Union people uh, made their little uh, recreation deal. Well, on the other side of the road, just before you get to the turn off to that recreation spot there, is this uh, spring and uh, pond that never freezes. And also, and those Western Union people, they claimed half of that Buffalo Springs Cemetery. It's about a quarter of a mile off the road on their side. And so I talked to Harley Hamilton, who was during the surveying and all, when they were setting up that little subdivision and selling lots and all. And uh, he said that the Western Union people were willing to deed their half of it to the county. And I said, well, how about the other half? He said, oh, those people would like to have something for their half of the cemetery. So I searched the records over at Fairplay. And back in 1937, three of the ranchers down there formed the Buffalo Springs Cemetery Association and bought the <laughs> cemetery from the people who owned it at that time. Of course, since then, uh, those ranchers have died, and uh, the association, the corporation, has dissolved and all that. So it's just sitting there. Nobody owned it. And uh, now the Western Union people have uh, uh, deeded the county a right-of-way into it, but the county hasn't done anything about building a road up to it. You still got to park down on 285 and uh, go through the barbed wire gate there and hike up the hill to the cemetery. So. Uh, it has been problems when uh, the county realized that they owned the Horn Cemetery. They had been reminded of it uh, by an attorney up in Greeley who said that some of the folks up there who had ancestors buried in the cemetery were unhappy. The, it wasn't being maintained and it turned out it had been deeded to the county in 1887. And all of these years down to 1976, uh, the Deer Park Valley Association had been ta paying taxes on that acre of ground. <laughs> and nobody was maintaining it. The fences were down, the cattle were coming in, and from 285, the people were going through the gate, driving over the graves, and going on down fishing on Lord Deer Creek in Trespass. The whole thing was a mess. And then when they widened 285 there, they got permission from everybody to widen the highway including the Deer Valley Park Association, but they never did get permission from the county. So that portion of 285 is in trespass, and we've even got two graves outside on the uh, 285 right-of-way up there. Uh, but <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, when the county realized what was going on and because of the pressure of our centennial coming up and all, they came up with some money and had me go ahead and see what I could do about some of these cemeteries. And so we had the county surveyor survey the Horn Cemetery, and I got some fellows to come up from Denver and put the chain link fence around it. And then I went down to the Lake George Cemetery. It was about as crazy. The people who owned the land had deeded it to the Lake George Cemetery Association. And there was never anything like that in existence. The people or anybody else, nobody knew a thing about it, including the one who were taking care of burials there. So we had enough money to go ahead and survey the land, and then we had money left enough to put a chain link fence across the front of it along the county road. And so that's the way that stands down there now. I wanted them then to do the Como Cemetery, since it's sitting there and there are no board of trustees controlling it. That hadn't been for probably 50 years or more. It's open land over there. If you want to be buried, just go over there and stake your claim. <laughs> and uh, I wanted that uh, quiet title to that in the name of the county. And uh, at that time, our county attorney says, oh, it's got to be surveyed sir, first. And so the county surveyor says it'll cost you several thousand dollars. Well, here it is, all adequately fenced, a nice gate into it, the whole bit there. 
the legal description on file in the clerk's office over at Fair Play, and then the attorney they had at that time says, no, we can't quite title to it going by that legal description. It's got to be surveyed first. It's crazy. But you need controls of some of these cemeteries, particularly nowadays when we're getting so much vandalism, uh, like that one at Como there. You know, they've got a Christian camp over there out of Como, and the kids were going from that camp over and tipping tombstones over in the cemetery. And Mrs. Blaney at that time, she was kind of keeping an eye on the cemetery. She went over and told the camp, the camp counselors about it, and they just laughed at her. She had to go on up, and they had to come down and say, no, that's off base for you kid. You can't do that. And one day, she saw a couple over there, and she didn't know what they were doing. She got a man in a Jeep to drive her over there. <coughs> They had one of the little children's marble tombstones there, and it had a little lamb carved on the top of it. They were trying to chisel that off. She asked them what they thought they were doing. They thought it would look nice on the mantle over the fireplace. <laughs> and there's another one over at Fairplay. They got that one. And these are the crazy things that go wrong. Uh, well, I have several questions, but cemeteries are my hobby, and I go to different states and take pictures of it because you know nobody bothers you there. So, um, what are, what's the most interesting, you know, grave that you've ever seen, and what's the funniest one you've ever seen? I mean, some I, I saw one in, in Tucson, Arizona, that's hysterical. Uh, we don't. I've never run into anything up here that it was particularly funny. You know, like uh, the poems, like. Uh, Someday you're going to be as I am now, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I haven't. Uh, we had one over at Como that said the man died of black water fever, or little things like that. And uh, but nothing that you'd say a uh, poetic masterpiece or anything like that. Uh, one of the uh, little cemeteries we have I've got a couple of pictures of it here. It's over by Park City. That's. Uh, when you start up mosquito. And it's not fenced, it's on private land. When we went in there, we found there were almost a hundred graves in there. And uh, a lot of them have little wood crosses on them now. There's only one tombstone in there. The early day folks tell me that they came in there uh, apparently along about the depression years and hauled off all the tombstones except one. That particular one, they got as far as Jefferson with it when the sheriff caught up with them and made them bring it back. So it's the only marked one in there. There is uh, a little uh, two quarter inch pipe fence around three graves up there. And I found out about those. There are no names there, but they were three railroad men who were killed when their train hit a burrow going up a mosquito there to the London mine. And so I've got the names of all three of those men, but which grave is which, I don't know. And I mentioned all of these people uh, who died back in the early days. It was rough back then. And uh, when they were building the track in 1879 across the park there, the last end of track down before they got to the Arkansas River and could go up the river on DNRG track to Leadville, uh, that town was called Weston. It was out in the flat part of the park there, southern end of the park, and uh, no protection, and just right out on the flats there. And it had only existed for five months, from October of 79 to uh, February 14th of 1880. That's when they got the bridge across the Arkansas down there. So overnight, everything shut down on these stagecoaches and freight lines that were taking freight and passengers over to Leadville going over Western Pass. And of course, that's how the little town got its name. But uh, I saw in the newspaper where at different times there had been shootouts over there at Weston, and two men had been killed. And so I figured their graves were down there somewhere. And one lady told me she had been down to those graves at one time. But I went over there with her, and she couldn't find them. Well, I went back several times and spent some time down there, and I located them. They're about a mile below the old town of Weston. And uh, I didn't find just the two graves as the two men were killed. I found 15 graves there. 
Six of them were adult, and the other nine were children. You can tell by the size of the gray old man. Well, that many children have died there. Uh, sometimes we think, wouldn't it be nice to be able to see the future? Well, think what that would be like. You couldn't take it if you looked at the people here and said, now you're going to be killed on the way home in an automobile accident. You're going to die from cancer. You just go right down the line. You couldn't take that kind of pressure. You get just a hint of it when you're doing some of this early day research, like on the heads, there's a, a little cemetery down at the head where the Foxton Road comes up to 285, up on the hills, that's a small cemetery. And there's a little a grave marker there. Now, in the 1870 census, the heads and their children were listed, and a happy family down there. He was running the store at that time. The place was called Hutchison, and so he had the store down there and a happy little family. And what he didn't know that was before the 1880 census came out, four of those kids within a few weeks were going to die of diphtheria. So you see, you couldn't take that sort of thing, but even looking at the census records, you see these things that are going to happen. And of course, that broke them up. He got a job uh, driving teams for the railroad, and she got a job cooking, and they followed the rail construction of the railroad until it got over Kenosha Pass to the little town of Jefferson. Although at that time, there wasn't any town there. He said this is far enough. They homesteaded 160 acres, used part of the land for the town of Jefferson. They stayed there the rest of their days and are buried over at Como. So these are some of the little things that have happened. Uh, can, do you know how the Horn Cemetery got its name? Uh, yeah, for the Horns. <laughs> but it was also called the... Uh, uh, Deer Creek Cemetery, or Deer Park Creek. Actually, in the early days, that was called Deer Park Creek. And uh, uh, even the stagecoach stop was called that. But the horns came in in the late 70s, and there are a lot of them buried in the cemetery there. Uh, the old folks are buried there. Uh, only one of the sons and his wife. But uh, a lot of the girls are buried there, and you don't realize it because they're buried under their married names. Like uh, uh, so uh, Solomon Nisley, for instance. Uh, she uh, married uh, Nisley, and she is buried there. Uh, one of the prosters there, the girl, was a horn girl. And so there are a number of the horns in that cemetery. Yeah. Harold, yeah. what could you tell us about the Shawnee Cemetery? I still haven't found anything where that was deeded to the county. And uh, uh, Price, uh, mostly the Prices who are buried there, and they want to more or less hold it for themselves. But the problem, of course, there are a lot of Tylers in there because some of the Tyler boys married the Price girls. And that's how they got involved in it. Some of the Prices married a second time, and those folks are buried in there. The Tylers were rather interesting because they traced their ancestors way back to before the revolution. They think that uh, uh, they are related to President Tyler. And I only knew of two Tylers up here because we had Ben Tyler Gulch and Bill Tyler Gulch. And so uh, when these streets were up Hall Valley there, uh, they sent me some pictures. One of them was of a man with a cow and a burro. And they said they came up there prospecting, and they were always glad to see him because he came up there with the old milk cow. So all summer long, they had fresh milk and cream and butter. So they were glad to see him, and they knew he was one of the Tylers. So uh, I took a picture down and saw Sadie Lamping, and uh, her father was Ben Tyler. So I showed her the picture, and I said, is this Ben Tyler or Bill Tyler? And she said, well, that isn't either one of them. That's Uncle Jim. And that's his cow babe. She recognized the whole thing. She said, I don't have a picture of him. Well, I make negatives off of these pictures, so I said, you do now. So she has one. But that's how I first found out that there were four Tyler brothers that came out here. Jim and Bill and Charles and Ben. But uh, three of them are buried here, and the fourth one is buried out in Nevada. Uh, one of the Tylers was supposed to marry the third Price girl, and she died before it could be done. So he left the country. 
But uh, these pilots were rather interesting because they were Southerners too. And they went out to California during the gold rush day. And uh, Jim was uh, old enough to go along with them. The mother was expecting another child along the way. It uh, was born and died. They buried it. The grandparents went with them. They died and were buried. And the wagon train ran over the grave so the Indians couldn't find them. Now out in California there, Jim got lost one day. And uh, so the miners dropped everything to go looking for him. And they finally found him. One of the Indian squaws out there picked him up. So she wasn't about to give him back to those rough old miners. Mama had to come and get him. And uh, they became good friends. And Mama was very grateful. She used to take the scraps of cloth and make quilts for the Indian woman. And the Indian woman, in return, was very grateful. But all she had to give in return were gold nuggets. It's real sad. The family did quite well out there, and then they came back across the Christmas and they came around that way. And uh, the old man Tyler, he was a captain in the Southern Army. Down there. And uh, I imagine most of these people came out here then in the 70s after the Civil War. So many of those Southerners lost everything and had to kind of. Let's quit. Yes, I agree with you. I'm sure there will be lots. Of course, I just babble on and on. There's no quitting. But you must realize by now we've got history up here. We've got to bring it back. May I suggest that if there are further questions, we ask Carl during the refreshment period. Or if you want to give me a call at home or anything. I'd be glad to tell you lies. Over the phone is safer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carol. This was uh, October 7th, Friday night, 1988. Harold Wins uh, talked on cemeteries. This is part of the Como Cemetery. All those pictures up for me. You get these pictures. See all the grave in the county, did he say? Okay, next one. John Parmalee's grave marker and his wife in Buffalo Springs. Okay. Okay. Here's John Parmley. Who's <laughs> this? John D. Parmley. Parmley Gulch. Okay. That's all I got here, then. Good uh, job, Fester Sweet, I think. I don't remember who he was when he was talking. It's on the tape. Yeah. Cemetery of Park City. Summit Marksbury. It's really not him. But it's really not him. <laughs> He's buried in California. This is Summit is supposed to be buried in California. This is Summit I to Marksburg. I own the Tyler Place. Oh. That's really not him. Yeah. Remember me talking to you this summer and asking you about uh, the Indian campsite in our front yard? You told me to go out there and look for Eric and I found him. Yeah. 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 Well, we have. Uh,